so much. What a blessing that was. Now take your Bibles and go to Revelation chapter 22. We'll get there in just a few moments, Revelation chapter 22, but I'd like to take just a couple moments. This is a holiday weekend and uh, scattered throughout our congregation. There are a number of people who are visiting and so I want to recognize several of those and then those I miss, you can help me and we certainly want to acknowledge those out of town guests. Over here on my right hand side, I see that Sam and Emily have their parents and sister from over in the Albuquerque area. So we thank you for being here. It's great to have you. They, they, your, your children are doing such an amazing job, uh, just wonderful serving here in our ministry. And so thank you for being here. And then Al Reynolds uh, uh, is here. It's been several months since he has been able to be here. Uh, he's had some tremendous health problems, and this is his first time in several months he's been here. Al, it is great to see you. Thank you so much for being here, and we appreciate uh, all the many prayers that you've prayed for us as you've been out. Uh, Al has regularly texted me and let, let me know that he was praying 
for our ministry. John Torsh's brothers visiting here from California. Thank you so much. It's great to see you. And Chloe Mingy's grandmother's here. Is that from Washington? Let's see. Uh, Oregon. I'm so sorry. I, uh, thank you so much for being here. It's great to see you. And Kelly Dunham's mom and dad's visiting from North Carolina. That's great. Uh, Joe and Janet have their daughter and son-in-law and two grandchildren visiting from Oklahoma. So that Kansas. Man, okay. I, 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 I didn't do so well in geography, I guess. Um, and so that's great to see you guys here this morning. It's uh, wonderful to have you. And then if you have, uh, let's see, uh, the Merklings have their daughter Jennifer here from Colorado. Did I get the right state? Okay. Okay. And, um, and uh, how, anyone else have family from out of town uh, that, we can just, that we can know your family's here? Anyone want to introduce your family? Um, I don't see any hands, but I just want to say thank you to all those who are visiting with us. Some are in town. You have certainly uh, already received a warm welcome from our church, and, and I thank you uh, for being here today. And I trust that you've already been blessed. Wow, the music was fantastic this morning. I mean, A++. And, uh, and I can say that because uh, I didn't have anything to do with it. I have nothing to do with it. I'm just so proud of uh, Sam and Emily, the work that they do from, from selecting the songs and practicing and preparing. And uh, what a blessing they are. And then our orchestra, they just did, they, they, they've grown. Church family, think about this. When I became pastor 11 years ago, literally, I am not exaggerating, it's, it's over here. I don't know if you remember this. Right here is where the pulpit was. 11 years ago, this is where the pulpit was. We've expanded our platform three times. I don't think there's any more expansions available, but I don't know what we're going to do, Brother Sam, if our orchestra continues to grow. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens, but uh, we'll put a second floor up here or something. Uh, but wow, that they, they was fantastic. Orchestra, thank you. You play a vital role in our music, and uh, I know that sometimes you play and, and it's unheralded. Let's thank our orchestra for the job that they, they do. Um, what is cute is that we have some children that are practicing with the orchestras on, uh, after church on Sunday morning, and so it's going to even get bigger, and uh, I am so thankful for all those that enhance the choir and the special music that play in our orchestra. You are a blessing to me, and I know to Brother Sam, thank you for your hard work. Uh, I love that song the men sang. I mean, we may just start doing that every Sunday morning to get the church started. Uh, that was a blessing. And uh, what, what's interesting is that it ties directly in the morning message. And then we just heard the trio sing, ties directly into the morning message. I've entitled the message, Jesus is Coming. And uh, the men sang, and, and one of those lines in the song is that they look forward to his coming. And, and by the way, do you know that Jesus is coming again? Uh, I, uh, I'm going to do this in reverse. So we're going to have a theme over the next four weeks about, uh, about receiving the gift. And, and, uh, and obviously that gift is going to come uh, on December 22nd when we preach. Uh, and we'll look forward to that. But I'm going to preach it in, in reverse order. So in Revelation chapter 22, we're going to start from the, what's about to happen and go backwards. And I trust that you'll be here all four weeks for this series. And if you're visiting out of town, you're not allowed to go back home until December 22nd. We've con, uh, finished our series, okay? Uh, uh, thank you for all those who are watching by live stream. We have over a thousand people that watch by live stream. And so it really is a joy to be able to enter into so many homes and enter in, in, into your hearts right here in our service. And it's great to see so many in the balcony this morning. I'm just is thankful and encouraged and ready uh, to spend this time with you. Revelation chapter 22. We'll be there in just a moment. and You'll stand, so don't get too comfortable. We'll stand as we read our portion of Scripture, several verses this morning. Did you know that the type, the printed type that most newspapers use for an astounding event is called second coming type? Uh, these large, heavy, black letters, uh, they're reserved for only that stupendous, amazing, tragic, front-page news event. Sort of like the return of Jesus. By the way, he's coming back. 
And when he does come back, every newspaper and all across the internet, it's going to be amazing to see what happens when multi-millions of Christians are raptured and taken out of this earth. And this earth is thrown into turmoil because here's what's going to happen. I don't know if you realize that. We realize that this is going to happen, is that when... Jesus comes back and he removes the church. That's the people who are members of the church. When he removes the church from the scene, what also is removed from this world? You guys are right on top of it, the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit is removed, the forces of hell are going to be released on this earth unlike any other time in, 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 in man's time period on this earth. And it's going to be a horrible place to live. May I plead with you, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, make that decision today. The banner second type coming is the type that's been used when it announced the surrenders in newspapers all across the world at the end of World War II that Germany and Japan had surrendered. It was also used uh, with the assassination of John F. Kennedy and the shooting of uh, President Ronald Reagan. This bold, heavy style has proclaimed successful flights into space and presidential election winners and other dramatic events of universal importance. But one day, mankind will witness the great event for which the second coming type was named for, and that's going to be re the return of Jesus Christ. There'll be some people here that may say, I'm not church people. I'm just here because I'm visiting family. I'm just here because really my arm was twisted and I had to come. Or I'm just here because that's what you're supposed to do on Sunday morning. Oh, I beg you, listen to what we're about to read as we stand together. Revelation chapter 22. We cannot deny that the Bible is true. The Bible is the only book that stood the test of time. The Bible is a living book book that we still look to for guidance today. The Bible is the Word of God. And with that in mind, listen to Revelation chapter 22 as we begin in verse number 7 and following. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And I, John, he's the writer of the book of Revelation, and I, John, saw these things and I heard them. And when I heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Now let me just stop right here and interject after verse number 8 is this. Is John is writing. We know that God does not use visions today because we have the completed word of God. We did not have the completed word of God at this time period. So God, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he allowed people to be the mouthpiece of God in writing the scripture. The book of Revelation was delivered into the prophet of, uh, uh, to the disciple, Apostle John, and he was there on the Isle of Patmos, and in a dream, in a vision, God showed him amazing things. In fact, um, uh, he even describes, if you're very careful in reading the book of Revelation, he even describes uh, what's going to happen in future battles, and he describes uh, 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 something that flies through the air that has like the head of a grasshopper. He had never seen seen something that we all come uh, that we're all accustomed to and it's called a helicopter and yet John 2000 years ago in a dream was was given privy to see something that would happen in the future this is what we're reading now verse number 9 then saith he unto me and so John is at the feet of the angel and then here is what is the direct revelation to John see thou do it not for I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly. And my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Oh, you should star put a, 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 a box around number 12. Behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me to give every man, woman, boy and girl according as his work shall be. 
I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have uh, right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates of the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I'm the root and the offspring of David and the bright and the morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, let's all say it together. The spirit and the bride say, and let him that heareth say, and let him that is a thirst, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Father in heaven, thank you. You have prepared the way. You've paved the way for the music to the preaching that took place in the music. Thank you so much for your choice servants who helped usher and bring us to this point where we open your word. Now let your word do the speaking. Father, may we be spoken to. Father, we stand in need. We need to recognize that you are coming again. And whether we're ready or not, you're still coming again. So Father, help us to be ready, looking, and anxious for your return. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. Jesus will literally come back to this planet that he left uh, so long ago, and he's going to fulfill the promise that we just read in this text. And when he does, it, it will command the attention of every inhabitant in this earth. The whole world will know that Jesus Christ is alive. Hold today, we say the name of Jesus, and it causes division. You go in the Middle East and you talk about Jesus Christ, and those are fighting words. Because the, the, those who are uh, living in that lifestyle, that way of life called Islam, Jesus Christ is like a curse word to them. May I just tell you, one day they will believe. But we who are privileged to sit under the preaching and teaching of the word of God, we will be without excuse because we should know that Jesus Christ is alive because we have the word of God. We don't live in a closed country where the word of God has been removed uh, from every bookstore. We don't live in a, a country where uh, uh, the, the indoctrination has been that Allah is God. We don't live in a country where uh, Buddha is the God of the country. We live in the greatest and freest nation in all the world, uh, a nation that uh, one day, uh, many, many years ago claimed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. May I just tell you, even if our nation changes, Jesus Christ is still the Son of God. And it will be a headline written in every newspaper, on every internet, across every iPhone, every iPad, every, uh, every electronic device that something dramatic has happened in this world. When Jesus ascended to heaven, the angels declared to his followers, you remember, there was a, a group of people gathered around, and Jesus, he left this physical world to go to heaven, and he's now seated on the right hand of God the Father in a place called heaven. In Acts chapter 1, verse 11, the Bible says, this same Jesus, which is taken from you up into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. The early Christians were often under severe persecution. Many of them became martyrs and they died for their faith. And for them, the greatest message of encouragement was the truth. This truth. Jesus was coming back to get them. And Jesus was coming back to take them home. Oh, we do not face the same problem here in America. We view the world uh, around us through newspapers and TV screens and a uh, computer monitor and our, and our phone. And we see the world growing more and more antagonistic toward Jesus and against his people. But currently, today, there's no one that's going to leave here and be martyred because you came to Tucson Baptist Church. You're not going to be put in jail because you came to Tucson Baptist Church. And here's what I fear is that because of all of this freedom, we've never counted the cost that that could happen in our country. And therefore, because we've never counted the cost, we're not looking for Jesus. Because we have this amazing freedom, eh, we take it. Jesus, one day we, we love him and the next day we want to live like we want to live. It's come or go. This or that. I'm, I'm fearful that for Christians, 
we become laissez-faire. We become that lukewarm. I, would, I want to spew you out of my mouth that Jesus said to the church of the Laodiceans. In the inner depths of our hearts, we ask questions like, uh, what can we do? To whom do we turn? What does the future hold? Uh, where is God in all this? I mean, you know, it's, it's, I'm looking at people that may be not as committed as those who have had to count the cost, and they can't wait for Jesus to come back. The answer to these questions, look in chapter 22 and verse number 12, is right before us in our text. John burst onto the page with, a, if I could use this, second coming type of print. And with the words of Jesus himself, he says this, I come quickly. What does he mean by that? This text is the conclusion of the Apostle John's visionary visit to the future that awaits the people of God. He's been shown a, a new heaven. He's been shown a new Jerusalem. He's been shown a new earth and a new city. And, and uh, uh, Jer- uh, uh, in chapter 21, verse 9, it tells us uh, of an angel in his tour guide. In verse number 7, the angel showing John what to write in the book of Revelation. The angel conveys Jesus' words about his return. Hearing this, John fell down to worship before the feet of the angel. And there's some tough men in this congregation. There's many military men in here. And there's some tough ladies that could give some of the men a run for their money. You serve in the military as well, or you do a lot of exercise. And uh, you are tough. Tough as nails. And you, because of what you have done, your exercise, your PTs, your, your, your emphasis on your body. May I just say, sometimes it gives you uh, uh, an attitude, an in, in, in air that you're invincible. And I'll bow down at the feet of no one is your attitude. May I just tell you, the whole world one day will bow down at the feet of Jesus. From the weakest to the strongest. From the superhuman strength guy that's racked up on steroids and his muscles are as big as I am. I mean, just one arm is as big as my whole body. One day he thinks he's tough, but he's going to bow at the name of Jesus. The person's on the wheelchair. Somehow she'll find her way to bow down at the name of Jesus. In verse number (coughs) 9, the angel's response is emphatic. He tells all of us, two words. Worship God. Worship God. In verses 10 and 11, the angel tells John not to seal this book up or put it away for the time is at hand. People are to study it so that they will know what will happen. And and turn back and read a similar statement in chapter 1 and verse number 3 of Revelation. It says this, Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Uh, Verses 12 and 13, we have a sure and a certain testimony of Jesus' concern, uh, Jesus, uh, what Jesus says concerning his second coming. The second coming, though, is distinct from the rapture. I don't want to confuse anyone. The rapture is going to take place. Jesus doesn't physically come to this earth. The rapture takes place and he takes the church out. Thankfully, if you know Jesus Christ, your personal Lord and Savior, you're not going to have to live through the tribulation period. I'm so thankful that I have that knowledge, and I have that salvation experience, and I have that personal relationship that one day I'm going to be raptured and removed from this earth. But the Bible does say that at the end of the tribulation, the second coming is when Jesus comes to this earth, and who comes with him? The saints. We get to come with him. It's coming. That's what we're speaking of. So I don't want to mix theologies today and confuse anyone this morning. The second coming is distinct from the rapture of the saints. However, I I think the context of the passage deals and gives us hope in both of these. So let's consider three areas of hope for this morning. And may we receive uh, this hope this morning. Hope number one. We see in Revelation chapter 22, verse number 7, the Bible says, Jesus is coming quickly. Jesus is coming quickly. That's a great hope. He's coming. Now, the word quickly may confuse some of us, so let me explain this word quickly. The word quickly may not refer to when Jesus will return. And by the way, how many years has it been since John wrote this? 
2,000 years. So apparently quickly has a little different definition than what John was thinking. Quickly, uh, uh, John penned these words, and we still await that coming. But I remind you in 2 Peter 3 and verse 3, Peter prophesied that knowing this first, that there shall come in those last days scoffers uh, walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep or died, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. So there are those who scoff at this part of the Bible. Listen. You've been saying that as have preachers for a millennium that Jesus is coming again. Where is he? And they scoff and they mock at God. However, in verse number 8, Peter reminds us, uh, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. So let's do some brilliant math. In the eyes of God, how many days has it been since Jesus went back to heaven? Two. It's only been two days because God doesn't live in the same time constrictions that we live. Throughout the New Testament, particularly in Jesus' words in the Gospels, we see many signs of his coming. Many of those signs have already been fulfilled, and some of those are being fulfilled this very day. Um, Based on such biblical evidence, I can confidently say that I believe Jesus is coming quickly. There's been a falling away. You had better be ready. He is coming soon. A second thought about quickly. The word quickly refers to how Jesus will return. If you understand, the word quickly is not about when. The word quickly is about how he's coming. Notice this in the Greek term, in the tense here, it's that when Jesus comes, his coming is going to be sudden. It's going to be surprising. It also carries the idea that it could happen at any time. Don't be unprepared. Now, we know that at the end of the tribulation time, that at some point in time, Jesus is coming. I imagine the entire world is going to be begging for Jesus to come back, to end this tribulation. And the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 2, For yourselves know perfectly the day of the Lord, so cometh as a thief in the night. Jesus said in Matthew 24 and verse 27, For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even into the west, so, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Lightning comes at the speed of light. And the coming of Jesus is going to catch man unprepared, according to Matthew chapter uh, 36. I think another thing about the word quickly, the word quickly is a warning that Jesus is coming back. It's a warning. Jesus is coming suddenly. And the question we ask is not, when will he get here, but will we be ready when he comes? Boom! At the speed of light, Jesus is coming back. And when he does, it's too late if you're not prepared. I read a great story um, about uh, uh, some of you who are older. Some of you uh, 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 in our Empower class, you'll probably never even heard this name. But how many of you who are older remember the name Orson Welles? Orson Welles. Orson Welles was way back at the very infancy of television, and he had been on the radio for many years. And he had a program. uh, We won't do a trivia this morning, but the program was called The War of the world. It, and he gave this story about an imaginary attack from outer space. Now remember, this is only on the radio. And that's how people listen to the news. I can't even imagine. Can you imagine only having AM radio? And that was your source of news, the source of weather, source of everything. You had to turn on the radio. Some of you are old enough to remember that. Some of you would say those were the good old days too. <laughs> Orson Welles was doing the drama uh, uh, entitled A War of Wards, and there was a student at Campbell College in North Carolina, and he turned on his radio midway through the broadcast, and he didn't realize that he was hearing a fictitious report. Now, I already established the fact the only way you got your news was from AM radio. 
He turns it on, and he, and he hears this report. The announcer vividly describing fire uh, falling out of heaven uh, out of the, uh, and onto the earth. The student recalled all of those sermons that, from his boyhood years, and, and he concluded that the end of the world had come. And he grabbed the telephone, and he called home, and he says, Mama, Mama, have you got your radio on? The fire is falling. The end of the world is coming, and I'm not ready to meet God. The next morning, as word spread throughout the campus of Campbell College, he was the object and the butt of of jokes and teasing around campus. But in the chapel service, uh, a godly Bible teacher, he took the podium and he said, he said, quote, I understand that one of the boys got a lot of ribbon because he got scared listening to the radio program last night. But young men and women, what if it had truly been the end of the world last night? Would you have been ready? End of quote. I ask you, are you ready? And as our men so eloquently sang with our choir this morning, as our trio sang, Jesus is coming. He's coming. It's not fictitious. It's not a made-up story. Are you ready? Hope number two this morning is this. Not only is Jesus coming quickly, but number two hope that we have this morning, Jesus is coming for you. Let's make it personal. Jesus is coming for you. Look in chapter 22 and verse number 7. The Bible says Jesus is coming for those who keep the prophecy of this book. Again, note the similar statement in chapter 1, verse 3. Those who read and hear and keep or take to heart the words of this prophecy, the Bible says, will be blessed. And those who first heard these words were facing the unknown. And if they held on to the words of God and kept the faith back 2,000 years ago, they faced persecution. Yet what else could they hold on to? Where could they go? Where could they find grace and love and mercy and hope in the words of this prophecy? What else can we hold on to except the word of God this morning? The message of hope for this generation is the message that comes to us from those who hold on to the word of God for their strength. The message is a message of power and of joy and of grace and of salvation. Are you one who keeps the prophecy or preaching of this book? If so, may I encourage you this morning, Jesus is coming for you. What a great hope this morning. Jesus is coming for those who do his commandments in chapter 22 and verse 13 and 14. He says this, he's the alpha and the omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. Verse number 14 is the last beatitude in the Bible. The phrase reads this, do his commandments. Isaiah chapter 1 says, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be is wool. May I just remind you that it is God who removes the stain of sin by washing us through the blood of Jesus. 1 John 1 and verse 7 says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Revelation 7 and verse 14 speaks of a time period called the tribulation of the saints who washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Have you washed your robe? Have you been immersed in Christ's blood? Do you do his commandments? If so, may I just give you some hope this morning. Jesus is coming for you. Jesus And coming for you, he's coming for those who've answered his call to this word. You read it over and over again. The one word, come. The Holy Spirit says, come. The bride says, come. Other believers in Christ say, come. All of us have an opportunity to come to Jesus. May I just say, have you received, have you come to Jesus this morning? God's invitation to life eternal is universal in scope. It is for the men and women of all ages. It's for the black and the white, the rich and the poor, the good and the bad. May I just say, it is for you, it is for me. The call come is a call to salvation. It's an invitation by God to become part of his eternal family. Have you received, have you responded to that invitation? Come. I ask you this morning, if you have done that, there is hope he's coming for you. One day you're going to 
be spared, whether through the rapture, the wrath of this world, or during the tribulation, all those people who trust Christ one day, they'll be able to, to go to heaven. But may I just implore you, you don't want to live through the tribulation period. There's a third hope. You say, why do I live life in this world? Why, do, why don't I just get saved and Jesus take me right out? Why don't I just have a heart attack and die as soon as I get saved? Well, that's because Jesus saved you to do something. And every one of you have been saved. There's a purpose for you. He says this, hope number one is I'm coming quickly. In other words, it's going to happen like that. Hope number two is that if you've come, he's coming for you personally. Hope number three is this, Jesus is coming with his reward. Jesus is coming with a reward for you. Look in verse number 12. Jesus has a reward for his faithful followers. There's a connection between the deeds we do in earth and the amount of value of our reward in heaven. Now, Lest there be someone here that thinks that I am preaching about salvation at this, at this time, I'm not. May I just tell you, Jesus teaches us in his word that salvation is by faith. It's a belief that Jesus Christ is who he says he is, and I trust him. There's no good works for that. It's an individual decision at a moment. I trust and I believe in Jesus. But at the moment of salvation, what I do for Jesus after that is where this verse comes into play. And that is, is that everything I do in this life must be for Christ, not the praise of man. It must be for Christ, not so that I could be honored and high and lifted up. Listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things that were done in his body. According to that he hath done, whether it be good or whether it be bad. One of the rewards for believers is a crown of righteousness. Paul even wrote about this when he was talking to Timothy. He said this, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all of them also that love his appearing. I like that condition if you see there at the end of that verse. But unto all them also that love his appearing. Are you ready for Jesus to come back? You should love that idea, love that concept. Be looking, be ready. Those uh, who have not come to Christ, they will be judged as well. And their reward will be eternal separation from God in a place called the lake of fire, a place called hell. But the greatest word that, reward that we will receive is that we'll be ushered into the presence of God. We know that this is ubiquitous, uh, equally present everywhere God is. However, sometimes we want to be where we can actually touch someone. Do you know the day is coming when we will be able to touch Jesus Christ? Physically. And that would be in a place called heaven. And one day, Jesus Christ, the God of heaven, they're going to acknowledge all of those who serve. Do you know... That there's going to be many, many preachers, their rewards are going to be smaller. Let me explain. We're expected to stand up here and preach and to study and to pray. It's part of our duties, our role. But there's going to be a lot of ladies who worked in the nursery and they didn't do it for the praise of man. They just served. Not expecting anything in this lifetime, but one day they're going to be acknowledged for serving in a place called a nursery and church so that we can listen to the preaching of God's word without a baby crying. There's going to be a, a choir member who didn't, never had the opportunity to be Don Booth. But she stood right there week after week, faithful as could be. Her name was never mentioned. Don't even know what part she sang. But she smiled and she gave honor to God every single Sunday. And one day there's a reward coming for her being faithful. There's going to be a lot of rewards given into heaven for people that were faithful. And they have a confident hope. 1 John chapter 3 verse 2 says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God? And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope 
in him, purifieth himself, even as he's pure. My friend, there is hope this morning. And as we enter into this four weeks of what we call the Christmas season, wasn't it great to sing Christmas songs this morning? You guys sang great. It's a, I, I, you can just sense when Sam is leading that, that uh, it's fun to lead when you guys know the songs and you love to sing Christmas songs. We love the Christmas season. And some of you, you shop till you drop over the last few days. You're tired and weary this morning because you spent so many hours shopping because you were just interested in buying gifts for other people that were on your list. And some of you ladies are so tired because you spent all this time cooking a great big meal for Thanksgiving and you're still weary even to this morning. And there's others of you, uh, whatever, you, maybe you had to work through this uh, over the last couple of days. You're tired and weary. In all of that, may it never get lost, Jesus is coming. It's an absolute assurance. And I'd like to ask you, are you ready? Are you ready? I had the opportunity to witness to a man who was in the hospital. I did not know him, but we got a call. And, and um, at that particular time, there was no one here, at, 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 at other pastors at the church. I said, I'll take it. And uh, so I went over to TMC Hospital, and I uh, walked in the room, and sometimes it's awkward, isn't it, Pastor Howard? We walk into a room, we don't know anyone, but we were, we were, we were just asked. So I walked into the room, and uh, I had met the man who made the phone call. I had met him before, and he used to, he, uh, he, before he moved back up into the Phoenix area, he sat over in this side. And it was his brother that was in the hospital. And again, it's an awkward as you walk into the room. The room was completely full of people. I only knew one person. The man that's there in the hospital bed, obviously struggling to breathe. Folks, may I just, uh, before I finish my story, may I just say this? Some of you have the idea, I'll just wait until I go to the hospital. I'll wait until the end. The truth is this, is they, they drug you so with all these comfort drugs that you may, have ne- you may never be in a clear mind again once you enter to the hospital. The opportunity may bypass you. Many times we have to pray for a moment of clarity where the, where the mind supersedes the drugs so we can talk to someone about Jesus because the hospital is all about comfort care. The man was obviously struggling. It was soon before he was going to die. You just don't come in like a bull in the china closet and, and say, uh, all right, here's what I'm going to preach a sermon. You don't know any of these people. And so I kind of waited, and I wormed my way over to the man who used to come to our church. And I, I, I said, uh, would it be okay if I talked to your brother? And he said, uh, yes, um, uh, please, please do. And he says, um, I've never told him about Jesus. By the way, that's a problem. If you believe enough in Jesus that you can't tell your family members, how much do you really believe in Jesus? I never told him. So I cut down and, and um, I called the man's name and I said, your brother has asked that I come and tell you that Jesus Christ, he, he died for you. And if you would just believe in him, he will save you. And when you die, you will go to a place called heaven. And I quickly, I just shared three or four verses from the Romans road. Not sure if he was even corresponding, but I'll never forget the words that the man did say. He said, it's too late for me. And I said, sir. It's not too late. You can believe in Jesus right now. And then it became really awkward in the hospital room. His daughter said, Sarah, you're upsetting him. I think it's time for you to leave. I said, I'm so sorry. May I have a word of prayer? And the brother said, yes, please pray. So I prayed, and then I backed out. I wasn't even down the hallway yet before his man died. That man, by in less than seven, eight seconds, he had a 
change of heart, his words were, it's too late. My friend, it's never too late. I don't care what kind of life you've lived this morning. Jesus is coming. Whether you like it, whether you actually believe it, whether you embrace it, your lifestyle today is Jesus coming back and you're going to be proud of it. Are you ready? Are you prepared to meet Jesus? You say, well, I'm a nominal Christian. I didn't ask what kind of Christian you are. Are you ready when Jesus comes back? He says he's bringing his rewards with him. And when he brings those rewards, it's going to be based on what you've done since you trusted Christ. Jesus is coming. Are you ready? Father in heaven, I pray that you will speak to us now. At this time, that the Holy Spirit will touch our hearts. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Please, please just listen to the questions for just a moment. You say, Pastor Armstrong, I'm not ready. The choir sang. Sam, Emily, and Tabitha sang. You've heard the message. Jesus is coming. We're looking forward to his return. But you say, Pastor Armstrong, I'm not looking forward to that. I'm not ready. I've never trusted Jesus Christ. If that was me in the hospital bed and I only had seconds to live, I would have died and I would go to a place called hell. You've shaken me this morning. The Holy Spirit speaking to my heart. I want to be ready. Would there be anyone among us that says, Pastor Armstrong, would you just pray for me? I want to get ready. I want to be ready for Jesus coming and I'm not ready. Would you just slip your hand up and put it right back down? I won't embarrass you. Yes, I see your hand. Thank you so much, ma'am. Right here in the middle section, a lady's raised her hand. Would there be someone else? Put your hand up and put it right back down. I won't embarrass you. Just say, I'm not ready. I am not ready for Jesus to come. Christian, what about you? That's a sobering question. I come quickly. I'm coming for you. And I'm coming with the reward that you have earned. What reward would that be? You say, Pastor Armstrong, in some area of my life, I'm truly not ready for Jesus to come back. I've got some things I need to talk to him about. Would you pray for me as well? Christians, would you raise your hands? Say, Pastor, pray for me. Hands all over, several, many, many hands. Yes, folks, we must be ready. Jesus is coming. Father, I pray that as we have this invitation time, that we will do business with you, and that we will not be ashamed to do business with you. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed as we stand together. If God has spoken to you, Pastor Howard and Pastor Matt, they're down here, and they would love to take an opportunity to pray just with you. As Brother Sam sings, would you respond to the preaching of God's word this morning? Search no more. There is an answer in this world of doubt and fear. He has come to lift your burden. I'd like for us to sing a couple verses of that song together. This is a powerfully written song. Many of us, we are broken. There are hurts 
And if you come to Jesus, he's going to heal those hurts. What a great song for an invitation song. Let's sing this. And as folks are still being dealt with, would you respond as God speaks to you? Search no more. There is an answer in this world of doubt and fear. He has come to lift your burden. Let's sing that next verse and let's sing it prayerfully back into the Lord. Oh, there's so many times I'm broken. I am truly a sinner that's been saved by grace. May we sing this back to the Lord in a prayerful sense as Brother Sam leads us and then on the chorus of a guy on the piano drop out. For the pain that's left you broken, he will give. Thank you for your beautiful singing. I'm going to ask Pastor Mike Collins to come. He's visiting with us from the great state of Kansas. I got it right that time. And uh, he's going to pray for our offering. I trust you as a member, faithful attender, you're prepared to give. December is a giving month. We gave a lot of money to the retail merchants over the last couple of days. So now let's give even more back to the Lord and do it joyfully so this morning. Would you pray for our offering? Father, we come before you and we're so thankful for the message we heard this morning through song, through preaching, uh, that you sent your son to come, not just to be born in a manger, but to die for us, uh, to pay for our sins, and then God, the promise that we have of eternal life, uh, that your son is going to come back and receive us unto himself. And Lord, I pray for those here who maybe haven't accepted Jesus. God, I pray that your word would work in their hearts. I pray that they would talk to one of the pastors yes. here. And accept Jesus as their Savior. And God, understand it's never too late. And uh, we thank you for the fellowship with believers today. Ask that you bless this offering. Continue to use it uh, to reach more and more people in the Tucson area with the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen.